Good afternoon. You are all such a wonderful sight. It, uh, I'm so, so pleased to have all of you here. I'm uh, Pastor Dave. I'm one of the pastors here at Good Shepherd. Uh, I know we have a wide variety of people come from a variety of parishes, uh, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, and probably many others. So we're, we're so delighted to have you here. Uh, before I go into intros, I just want to offer a quick prayer, and then I'll give you a few things, and then we'll kick into the full program. But let us pray. Almighty God, in this uh, Trinity Sunday, we give you thanks for your, your goodness and uh, your love that you share in this world, that you share in our lives. Uh, we simply pray that you would use all of us to, uh, to spread your good message across this earth, especially in the uh, communities in which we're called to serve uh, right here in our midst. Uh, we uh, thank you for Father O'Malley and his witness over many, many years. Uh, we're grateful for his presence with us this day and uh, simply ask that you would... Uh, Use him in this time of sharing as we grow in our understanding. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to real quickly introduce you to uh, two of the pastors that serve alongside me here at, at Good Shepherd. We have uh, Pastor Ted, who's just a couple rows back here, who is uh, the Bishop Emeritus of the Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Synod. He's our support pastor here. And uh, Pastor Kate Costa uh, just began about six weeks ago as our associate pastor here. So we're uh, delighted to, uh, to have them here in our midst. I um, want to just say that this, uh, Father O'Malley has graciously allowed us to record this uh, presentation. So I know a number of you have friends who would like to be able to, to experience this. So it'll, if you go to Good Shepherd's uh, Facebook or uh, website, we'll, uh, we'll pr post it prominently so you can share it with others. Uh, in September, we'll also have another uh, kind of ecumenical uh, experience, so uh, check back in early September. We'll have a, another experience to invite you to. Um, after this time of sharing and questions, we're going to invite you all for a time of fellowship in, our, in Shepherd's Hall. We have a very important ecumenical song that we would like to sing together, so you do not want to miss that. So. At the end, we're going to just ask Father O'Malley to join us in there and sort of ask you all to come there as well. And with that, I'm going to invite Sam Wagner to come forward to introduce our uh, prominent guest speaker. Sam is a member of our church council, uh, works at Georgetown University. Uh, I've known Sam probably almost 15 years. He's just one of those most dynamic, thoughtful people I know. Uh, he plays the sitar and has often led our uh, taizé. I probably said that horribly wrong. Uh, but he, uh, what, what's that? Oh, but the Taze, he, Sam has led our Taze service here, and we would like to uh, hopefully offer that more frequently. But Sam, please come forward. Thanks, Pastor Dave. Um, well, it's, it's really a great honor um, and pleasure to introduce and welcome my colleague, and I think I can say friend as well, uh, Father John O'Malley, uh, SJ. And for those of you who are lifelong Lutherans, the initials SJ at the end of his, of his name means he's a, he's a Jesuit, meaning he belongs to the Society of Jesus. Um, the Jesuits were founded by Ignatius of Loyola, and officially became a religious order in is 1540, about correct? Okay. Um, so this is all, you know, during the time period of the, of the Reformation. Um, Father John O'Malley is a Jesuit priest and university professor at Georgetown University. Um, he's a prize-winning author and popular lecturer, both at Georgetown and in the U.S. and abroad. Um, and he specializes in the church history of Europe. His, uh, his books, Trent, What Happened at the Council and What Happened at Vatican II, have been translated into no less than five European languages, all languages that I understand Father O'Malley at least reads, if not speaks somewhat fluently. <laughs> um, last year, in recognition of Father O'Malley's scholarship, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences of Harvard University conferred upon him its Centennial Medal, the school's highest honor. And he recently published uh, a book titled The Jesuits and the Popes, um, engaging on a topic of current significance in light of Pope Francis, who we know now is the first Jesuit to become a pope. And today, uh, in light of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, 
um, Father O'Malley is here to talk to us about um, Vatican II and its significance beyond, um, beyond the Catholic Church. And the title of his lecture is Vatican II in You, 500 Years After 1517. And um, lastly, uh, I just wanted to just make a quick mention that, uh, as Pastor Dave alluded to, uh, today is Father O'Malley's birthday. And it's not... <laughs> <laughs> May I say it's it's not just any old birthday. Today he is 90. <laughs> and he's publishing yearly multiple times. <laughs> um so Father O'Malley it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome. Well, <laughs> I'm very happy to. Ooh, boy, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here for any number of reasons. Among them, my friendship with uh, Sam. We work together at Georgetown, and we become really good friends. We've been on many adventures and organizing things and so forth. So it's a real pleasure to be here. As, you, as he mentioned, my topic is Vatican II and you. Uh, so what? I mean, Vatican II is 50 years old. Uh, let me just say that one reason is there are three big inter anniversaries floating around. Uh, 2017, uh, 13 was the 450th anniversary of the closing of the Council of Trent. Uh, 2013 was the 50th anniversary of the closing of Vatican II. And this year, of course, is the uh, 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. Uh, those three events make sense together. So that's a reason for kind of taking a look at Vatican II. <clears throat> but let me bring this down to very vivid reality. Uh, imagine 1955. My mother had died and my dad remarried, and he remarried a woman who was not a Catholic. So how's this wedding going to take place? Uh, it took place in the priest's residence in his office, and in the office was my dad, his spouse, and the two witnesses. The rest of us sat outside in the parlor, and in three minutes, it was all over. <clears throat> Just a month ago, excuse me, <clears throat> just a month ago at Georgetown, precisely a month ago, I officiated at a wedding of Charlie Beller, who's a Roman Catholic, and uh, Alexandra uh, Rossellini, who is a Lutheran. And I presided at the ceremony along with a Lutheran pastor. It was held in the chapel with music, reading from the scriptures, and both of us spoke. I mean, that would be unthinkable. 50 years ago. And now we sort of take it for granted. So Vatican II and you, that's how it touches all of us. Um, so Vatican II, just to bread and butter facts, 1962 to 1965, uh, what's a council? A council is a, my definition is <clears throat> a meeting principally of bishops gathered in Christ's name to make decisions binding on the church. So there've been hundreds and hundreds of them and 21 that the Catholics consider ecumenical or church-wide. So Vatican II changed a lot, had a big impact, and Charlie Beller and Alexander Rossellini are a good example of it. Uh, some people would interpret Vatican II as implicitly a Catholic rehabilitation of Luther. Uh, that may be an exaggeration or may not be an exaggeration, but that's one way of looking at it. So let's take a look at the Luther anniversary, 500 years ago. What is there to say about Luther? Well, Luther libraries are filled with books about Luther. Just a couple of main points. One is his doctrine of justification. This was a key point. Uh, he was against any kind of save yourself theology, any kind of save yourself spirituality. God saves us. It was a life and death issue for him. And 
in my opinion, it's the life and death issue for all of us. Because it's basically, what is our relationship to God? How do we relate to God? And that's a life and death issue. Uh, the second point is, in 1520, he wrote an appeal to the German nobility, which was a call for the reform of the church. Many things can be said about that, but one thing it is, it's kind of a grocery list of things the church needed to change. Most of them dealing with the Roman Curia and with the papacy. Uh, that was a kind of a synthesis, really, of a lot of ideas that were floating around at the time. So in that, in that sense, it was nothing original. It was something that was taken up by Catholics later. But it's the other side of Luther. So what happened to him? He was excommunicated in 1521. And then in the 1530s, as you know, the uh, Augsburg Confession was formulated, and the Small Caldic League was formed, which was the League of the German Princes together to defend themselves against Catholics and to promote the Reformation. So with that, Lutheranism became a system. It was no longer a series of sort of individual reformers, but it became a system, and that's important. So moving right along, <clears throat> let's go to the Council of Trent. So 1545, so some years after Luther, some years after the Augsburg Confession, uh, to 1563. So the council dragged on, off and on, for over 18 years. And that gives you some idea that it was a very difficult meeting. Uh, it's often portrayed, implicitly at least, in history books as a meeting met to condemn the Reformation. That is wrong. It was a meeting convoked actually to try to find a way of reconciling the Catholic Church with the Reformation. This was the idea insisted upon by Emperor Charles V, the German emperor, who, with Pope Paul III, they were the two architects of the council. Paul III, highly skeptical that this reconciliation could take place, but ready to go along with it. So almost when the council got together, they realized that justification was the key issue. And they spent seven long months hammering out the decree on justification. It was the most considered document of the whole council. Uh, and they were, the council fathers were very sensitive to this accusation that the Catholic Church preached a save yourself spirituality. So the first three canons of the, of the document on justification are very clear that it's through grace, only through grace, and always through grace, but through God's favor that we are saved. Then it goes on to say, well, but somehow or other we contribute something, and goes on and on and on. And that's the problem with the document. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> so it's very difficult to summarize. Uh, and that's still the confusion that reigns, and so God helps those who help themselves. I mean, we find that all the time, and we know that theologically that's wrong, and Catholics should know that's wrong. I hope they do. Uh, so that was one thing, the justification issue. The second issue was to reform the church. As I said before, uh, Luther's list was a common list of things that everybody was, or not everybody, but a lot of people were agreed upon, and the Council of Trent was agreed upon. So it took upon itself this great task of reforming the church and did a lot of wonderful things, like forcing bishops to live in the diocese, uh, the found, founding of seminaries, and uh, trying to reform the Roman Curia. They ran into a lot of problems reforming the Roman Curia. It's uh, like the uh, perennial indoor sport of Roman Catholics trying to reform the Roman Curia. But at any rate, they made a little progress in that regard. Uh, so what about the, abs the impact, final impact of the council Well, instead of furthering reconciliation, it actually, as it was interpreted and implemented and so forth, 
exa uh, uh, exaggerated or uh, exasperated the problem. So it became an obstacle rather than a help, uh, which is too bad. Uh, I've spent a lot of my life trying to rehabilitate the Council of Trent and getting a better perspective on it, but that's the way it's often interpreted. So it also, what do we have in Europe? Uh, from 1546 until 1648, 100 years of religious wars. Catholics against Protestants, Protestants against Protestants, to some extent Catholics against Catholics. It's a horrible time. Uh, fast forward. 1945. We talk about 1945 to 1960. 1945, the end of the Second World War, that bloodiest conflict of all times. After the First World War, which was also, up to that point, the bloodiest conflict of all times. People were sick and tired of conflict. And what had happened, Catholics and Protestants were in the trenches together they got to know one another. They realized that uh, Catholics weren't devils and Lutherans weren't devils. Uh, what's to happen here? Uh, mixed populations. We're so used to that in the United States from the very beginning. But this was not true in Europe. And bit by bit, by 1945, every country had, to some extent, mixed populations. So side by side again. Then there was the problem of the Holocaust. Christian Germany, Catholics and Lutherans. How to deal with that? Then there was, on the positive side, there was since the beginning of the 19th century, done by uh, Protestants, so the ecumenical movement. Because the scandal of Christian churches sort of an enmity with one another. And this was especially a problem in the foreign missions. Uh, have Christian groups and comp com competing with one another. Very confusing for people who are trying to be converted. But then what else also happened in 1958 <clears throat> was the election of uh, Father Ron Cali, Cardinal Ron Cali, to the papacy, John the 23rd. A very unusual man. He came from a really poor peasant family up there in northern Italy near uh, Milan, Bergamo. Uh, found he was so poor, he was ordained in Rome. His family was so poor, they could not afford to come to Rome for his ordination. Uh, he remembered that all his life. He kept in contact with his brothers and sisters all his life. Uh, he was very interested in church history, was uh, assistant to the Bishop of Bergamo, and began to write a sort of five-volume study of Charles Borromeo, one of the great figures around the Council of Trent, so very serious man. Then he was appointed apostolic delegate to Bulgaria for 10 years among the Orthodox, then 10 years in Turkey among the Muslims, then five years in France at the very difficult time at the end of the First World War, and only then does he become Pope. So he was a person with a tremendous range of experience. And while he was in Turkey during the Second World War, he had helped Jewish refugees escape and get out of the Greece especially and other places where they were located. So he was elected as a transitional pope. He was old, for, considered old at that time. I should talk. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, and he reigned for only five years. But to everyone's surprise, in, after he'd been pope for only about three months, he announced on January the 25th, 15, uh, 1959, that he was going to call an ecumenical council. Uh, nobody expected that. Last council had been held 100 years earlier. Many people thought that was the, would be the last of the ecumenical councils. 
How did he describe the purpose of this council? Two ways. First, to promote the enlightenment, edification, and joy of the entire Christian people. Second, to extend a cordial invitation to the faithful of the separated communities to participate with us in this quest for unity and grace for which so many souls long in all parts of the world. So the first thing you note about those purposes is how positive they are. Uh, and that second one, note it was not an invitation to return to the Catholic Church. It was an invitation to participate with us in this quest for unity and grace. What were the immediate results? The immediate results was first, he set up a secretariat for Christian unity, which originally was not much more than a guest bureau for observers from other Christian churches and bodies who were invited to the council, but soon developed into probably the most important body in the whole council under Cardinal Bea. Uh, so that was the first thing. That was for Christians. But then even before the council opened, he was visited by a French Jewish scholar, Jules Isaac, who had documentation and pointed out to him how Catholics had uh, denigrated the Jews in sermons and books and so forth, and then brought up the whole problem of the Holocaust. So John ordered the secretariat to prepare a document on the Jews. Extremely important move. So with those two measures, again, I can say that the Second Vatican Council was essentially a council of reconciliation. And I think if you keep that in mind, you'll have a framework for understanding it that can sort of guide you in your study of it, and your reflection on it. So what about the council itself? I describe it as the biggest meeting in the history of the world. That is a mouthful. Uh, I've been sort of uh, promoting that idea for years, and nobody's been able to challenge me, <laughs> which I'm surprised at. But at any rate, uh, it was a meeting of over 2,000 bishops, about 500 theologians, and about 200 observers at the peak. Um, it met from September to December four years, 1962, 1963, 1964, 1965. But that's misleading because in the interim months, a lot of work was still being done on the council. So you can say the council met continuously for four years, but oh no, wait, it's more than that because the two years before the council were all engaged in working for the council. So it was a meeting, so business was to be done with all these people present on this wide agenda and over the course of six years. So it is the biggest meeting in the, in the history of the world, in my opinion, and it made some landmark decisions, took unexpected terms, and unexpected terms that were supported by an overwhelming majority of the bishops in the council. So among the great influences at the council were the non-Catholic observers. They could not speak, but they had a place of honor in St. Peter's, best seats in the house, really. Um, and uh, they informally, they met every week with uh, the Secretary for Christian Unity. And then, well, this was a Catholic affair, but Lutherans would understand. In St. Peter's, during the council, there was a bar. <laughs> I've worked a lot at the Vatican Library. One thing I like about the Vatican Library is 
The only library in the world where I know there's a bar. <laughs> it really helped my research a lot. The, uh, but at any rate, uh, so in the, in the bar, and the breaks and so forth, all this, in, all this conversation going on, so it had big, big, big influence. So what were some of the decisions? Well, just a few of them. The first document of the council, the first issue it dealt with, was liturgy. A lot can be said about that, but one thing that's important is that the council opened the way for what we have today, a complete Catholic vernacular liturgy. As you know, that was one of Luther's uh, main points, one of his great services, actually. It's interesting. The Council of Trent also allowed vernacular liturgy. But after the council, things were so hot that it got completely lost sight of. So you often hear that Trent uh, insisted on Latin liturgy. That's not true at all. That's absolutely false. Uh, so not only vernacular liturgy, but then also a special new emphasis on the liturgy of the word, the first part of the mass. So uh, before that, it was, <laughs> it was something sort of you kind of got out of the way until you moved to the real heart of the thing, which was the Eucharistic part. Well, no, they're of equal dignity. And so the way the liturgy was now restructured and emphasized was this emphasis on liturgy of the word, which, of course, is very dear to Lutheran hearts. Um, another point of the document on uh, liturgy, emphasis on local adaptation, especially non-Western cultures. So a global look now. Latin, a Western language. Um, uh, this was difficult in the post-war years. The colonialism is passe and so forth. So now a global structure and form for the liturgy. Moving along, the second major document was a document on the church. Again, a lot could be said about that. Let me just say that one important aspect of it was what it said about the relation of the Catholic Church to other Christian churches. And basically, it did not say the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ, but the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. That is, it's found in the Catholic Church but it doesn't say it's not found elsewhere. As a matter of fact, the council goes on to say that uh, the elements of salvation, especially baptism and the word of God, and for Lutherans, the Eucharist, are found outside its visible confines. So just who's in and who's out, the boundaries are not so clear as people would like to think. I remember in 1946, 1940s, uh, there was a Jesuit in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right outside Harvard, who was preaching and insisting there's no salvation outside the church. That is to say, there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. And he took this in the most literal and strictest terms possible, so that anybody who was not a member, a, visible, a member of the visible Catholic Church, was impossible to be saved. This did not go down terribly well in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and it did not go down very well with the president of Harvard, who wrote to the archbishop and said, what are you going to do with this guy? Uh, so the archbishop, of course, uh, decided to pass the buck and sent the whole thing to Rome. So the answer came back, well, whatever that axiom means, it does not mean what Father Feeney is saying it means and that there is salvation outside the church by those voto e desiderio are somehow in the Catholic Church. Those who by desire and uh, their heart are in the Catholic Church. It was a, a breakthrough in that axiom. A third document was obviously the document on ecumenism. So it gave Catholics not simply permission, but uh, 
urge them to take part in ecumenical endeavors, to pray with their non-Catholic neighbors, to work together on all, any projects that were for the common good, and so forth. So somehow they're working together towards unity, whatever that might in the distant future look like. And one reason, way to promote this idea was dialogue. That is to say, heart-to-heart -heart talk, just what you believe. We're not trying to convert you. You're not trying to convert us. We just want to know where you stand, where, how you believe, what are your values, and see where that leads us. The fourth document, then, was the document on non-Christian religions, Nostra Aetate. This has developed out of the document on the Jews, and now included all non-Christian religions. A long session, a section, it's a short document, but a relatively long section on the Muslims and then on the Jews. And again, respect for these other religions, uh, trying to find out what we have in common rather than what divides us. And again, dialogue being the instrument. So in that regard, I'd like to call attention to Pope Francis, when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he and the leading Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Skorka, did a series of dialogues together, open agenda, uh, open to the public, and later published as a book. Now, in the whole history of Christianity, I don't know of any Catholic prelate, or I would almost guess any other leader of a Christian church, to do something like that. And it seems to me that was dialogue in its best form, and what a wonderful example that is. So uh, reverence and dialogue, the instrument for the future. The final document I will mention is the final document of the Council, the big document, the Church in the Modern World. Again, this was a reconciliation document. It's a document about the Church in the Modern World. It's not the Church for the Modern World. It's not the Church against the Modern World. It's not the Church above the Modern World. It's not the Church below the Modern World. It's the Church in the Modern World. So it's a recognition of a fact. And the basic fact is, here we are, we're together. Let's work together. Let's work together against poverty for peace, the end of the arms race, and other good things. So that's an overview of the council. What about after the council? Well, at one point during the council, it looked as if we were all going to come together in one big happy family. And the kind of apex of this hope was in January of 1964 when Pope Paul VI in the Holy Land met the Greek patriarch. And they embraced for the first time in, what, 800 years. And then at the end of the council, the mutual excommunications that were thrown, uh, were uh, promulgated in 1059, were lifted. So that was a great sign of hope. Well, that hasn't happened. But still, we've come a long way. And I think Charlie Beller and Alexander Rossellini are the two, are two good examples of how far we've come, and I need not sort of beat that horse here with you. So we should rejoice in the progress. What about justification? As many of you know well, in dialogue, Roman Catholics and other churches have been meeting ever since the Council and taking different topics. And with the Luthers, of course, the key topic was justification. So a mutual agreement on the subject was signed. When was that, Sam? About 99, 1999. So yeah, there's still problems there. But basically, this, this, there's no reason for this to be something that divides us. What they realized is 
the Council of Trent and Luther, two different worlds of, two different language worlds. Uh, for Luther, this was a life and death passionate issue. For the theologians of the Council of Trent, it was an academic issue. How are we going to understand this? And so they were not, they were not talking to one another. They were missing one another. But if you can get beyond that, you can see how close they were. So that is, um, I think, a, a tremendous pro process, progress, especially for Catholics and Lutherans. So you and me today, so what? I think rejoice in the progress. Sam Wagner here, a member of your church council, has been working with Catholics now for 20 years and has survived. Uh, <laughs> At the theology department in Georgetown, the leading ethicist is a Lutheran woman. Uh, that's one thing, rejoice in the progress. B, see what we can do together about our world. I need not say much more about that. See, I'm prejudiced, but I think Pope Francis is leading the way. He went to Lund in Sweden at the invitation of the Swedish bishop to celebrate, observe the Reformation. Boy, oh boy. That's a landmark. Uh, he does it as if almost as a matter of course, and it's didn't hit the front page of the New York Times, but it's still a big thing. Then, as you know, he lives in the sort of guest house there in the Vatican. He won't live in the Vatican apartment, won't live in the Vatican palace. He's turned those papal apartments into homes for Muslim refugees. So what a wonderful example he gives us in that regard. So. I think Vatican II is um, one landmark along the way in our, in our pilgrimage together, but it's an important one, and one that's worthwhile to reflect about and to consider and to see how it impacts our lives. Thank you very much. It's not over yet. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father O'Malley, for that uh, very enlightening He's overview. He's being very, very <laughs> polite to get He calls me John, but okay. <laughs> um, we'd like to open the floor to some questions or comments, a few questions or comments, if uh, anybody would like to engage. Yes, please. Reformed Church of Ulrich Zwingli. What if, any, what, if anything, did Zwingli do to influence Luther? Well, I'm not a Luther scholar. I uh, have studied Luther and so forth. So I think, I don't know how much he influenced him, but he certainly, he made uh, very keen the whole question of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Because, as many people describe Zwingli, as, uh, he believed in not the real presence, but the real absence. And uh, Luther certainly, and the Lutherans certainly did not go along with that. So he kind of made that a topic of uh, uh, concern and definition for the Lutherans. And maybe some, some Lutheran specialist here would like to maybe do more on that than I can do, but that's at least a stab at it. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Given the end of World War II 
and the transition into the restructuring of, of Europe, the rebuilding of Europe and of Nazi Germany. The Nuremberg trials took place approximately the time when Vatican II was being talked about. How did the German Catholics then come to grips with what had happened in their country and what they have done to the Jewish people? And how did that affect uh, Vatican II? Well, I can answer that almost in the same terms I've done already. Uh, I think not just for German Catholics, but for German Lutherans and for all Germans. It's not been easy to come to terms with that. I mean, it's not easy for us to come to terms to what we did in the Second World War either. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a slow process uh, trying to admit that that horrible thing that went on for years. And, you know, there are all kinds of excuses. People didn't know or didn't only half knew or whatever, so it goes on and on. So uh, I think, I mean, the turning point really was, so people knew about the Holocaust. But it really wasn't until the 1960s that we began to get all these studies about it and so forth. It became really a big issue. And in 1964, January, uh, in Germany, the, uh, this young German playwright, uh, Rolf Hochhut, wrote this play, The Deputy, that is to say, The Vicar, The Vicar of Christ, kind of pointed the finger at Pius XII and said, you're responsible. If you had just spoken out, this would never have happened. So that made it a, really a very crucial issue for the council and for Catholics. At any rate, the real crucial point, though, was this visit of Jules Isaac to uh, John XXIII. And he had the dossier. And he said, now, you know, what are you going to do about this? So John XXIII hands it over to the Secretary for Christian Unity. And who was in charge of the Secretary for Christian Unity? Augustine Be Bea, a German. So when, Ger when De Bea introduced this document, in the council, he said, da da da, here it is. Da, da, da. This is a German who's speaking to you. So there's a public acknowledgement late by a leading German Catholic about responsibility for this horror. Gracias por estar aquí. Thank you for being here. As a Puerto Rican lady who was raised Catholic, you know, in this spectrum of you cannot be anything else but Catholic, you know, when I came for many reasons to the United States, which Puerto Rico is also a U.S. territory, you know, I, for some reasons that the Lord helped me with my autistic child, I became Lutheran. But I also say here to my fellows that I'm Catholic Lutheran. And I told you, remember, I said, and when I am in Fort Lauderdale, I go to the Catholic Church, and when I'm here, I am here. And I take communion on both. Sometimes, I told Pastor Ted this morning, I feel like I'm a traitor because I know here I can take communion and it's open. So it's like, oh, let me go take communion with the, you know, with the priests. How, how do you see those things that are just, you know, I cross, I think maybe I'm doing something more as a rebellious person doing that, knowing that it might be wrong, but I know I want to take communion anywhere I go. How do you see that? Well, uh, <laughs> Let me not answer your question. <laughs> Let me just say that I had, of course, I taught in Second Vatican Council at Georgetown. And when I teach that course, I mean, it's a, it's a mixed and gathering of students. I mean, atheists, Jews, Muslims, uh, Protestants, so forth. And one last time I taught it, there was this very devout Lutheran there. And 
I kept saying to him, Sam, you're a crypto Catholic. <laughs> and he kept saying to me, John, you're a crypto Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll let it go at that. <laughs> but I must say, I mean, really personally, uh, in my theology, in my personal piety, I am, I understand Luther uh, this way on justification, that uh, justification by faith alone, okay, that's a biblical term and so forth, you go to whatever that means. What he was trying to say, I think, is we believe in God's unconditional love. Uh, it's unconditional love, I mean, not, I don't deserve it. <laughs> Uh, it's just there, it just comes to me. It's there for me. And uh, if that isn't the good news, I don't know what the good news is. So, that's me. <laughs> There's one over there, yeah. Thank you for your words. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that it had been a hundred years uh, prior to Vatican II. Won't you hold it up? A little, hold it up. Hold it up. I yes. Uh, thank you for your words. And you mentioned in them that it had been about a hundred years prior to Vatican II when the last uh, Ecumenical Council took place. I'm wondering, are there any issues today that might that you can see? Um, where uh, an, an, another ecumenical council might come into play or would be called, or what, what might prompt another council? Well, that's a good question. I'm often asked, uh, don't I think uh, it's about time for Vatican III? And I always say, no, never. Uh, no more Vatican III's. Uh, we need a Manila one, we need a Rio de Janeiro one, we need a Chicago one. Uh, not in the Vatican anymore. We had two of those, that's, that's enough. Uh, so what would be the reasons, motive for, for a new ecumenical council? Well, it's often said about Vatican II that it was unique, but it really wasn't unique, but certainly special in that it met when there was not a great crisis in the church. Well, actually, I don't buy that. It was not such an obvious crisis, but it was a deep, deep, deep cultural crisis because the very foundations on which the Christian faith was built were, were had been shattered, been being shattered ever since the Enlightenment. And finally, the church had to kind of face those things. So it was a it was a real crisis. So, but you don't need a crisis to have a council. I mean, in the Middle Ages, the great council, the Fourth Lateran Council, there was no crisis. So I don't know. But really, certainly for the Catholic Church, it would be very difficult to have a council in the pattern of Vatican II, simply because at the time of Vatican II, there were about 2,500 bishops in the world. And of course, one of them were old, sick, or for other reasons couldn't come, or behind the Iron Curtain, weren't allowed to come by the government. So by and large, about 2,000, just about fit in St. Peter's. Now there are about 7,000 Catholic bishops throughout the world. Where are you going to put them? <laughs> and when you get a meeting that size, it's um, how are you going to manage it? How are you going to you know, have it in any way be participatory? So I think maybe the way that I think Pope Francis is leading us with this latest, latest synods is to have these representatives come and maybe at a sort of stated intervals almost to kind of keep on top of things. So at least for the time being, I think that's the way to go. Now, of course, synods have been in their old, old, old tradition in the church, but kind of got a new kind of lease on life with the Second Vatican Council, but they really weren't working the way they were supposed to until Pope Francis, when he really encouraged the bishops to say their mind, to speak out. And so you really you get issues on the floor, kind of disturbing sometimes, but they're on the floor. 
So I think things along that line are, are much more reasonable and feasible, at least for the time being, than, a, than another ecumenical council. One more a, than this one. I have a question that goes toward the idea of a legacy. Well, the idea of what? Legacy. Um, it is one thing for the president to sign that uh, the United States treats everyone the same legally. It's another thing for people to change their hearts. Throughout my life, any time I've happened to discover that the person I was talking to was from the Roman Catholic Church, I would advise them that I was a Catholic. I was not a Catholic. I was a uh, Lutheran. And inevitably, I get some comment along the line of, oh, our church really hates your kind. <laughs> uh, and it, it was in the context of delivering a uh, recording of a Catholic, Roman Catholic text just last year in Washington. Uh, admittedly, the book was from the 40s but it was a little uncomfortable for me to be reading the words that the greatest uh, attack on the, Luth on the, uh, Rome, the Christian church in its history was Martin Luther. I didn't think he had quite uh, been noted for that, and for, to find something like that in a a uh, text that apparently was still being used in uh, Washington churches of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, I obviously found a little bit unsettling. Uh, how do we change people's minds that uh, what they have learned over the years is, is, is permeable, is is elastic is can, can ch uh, change over time? Yeah, well, good question. I mean, it's, it's very hard to do. Uh, we grow up and we grow up with certain ideas and it's not easy to change them. Uh, we're sort of set in our ways. Uh, I would just say that in 1940, read some Protestant texts about the Catholic Church. They weren't very complimentary either, you know, so uh, that's too bad. Uh, and that's, what, that's why the period after the Second World War was so crucial in a much more widespread admission, I mean, through, through historical studies, through everything else, that this was wrong, this was historically inaccurate, it was getting us no place. You know, shooting one another is not a good way to solve these problems. Uh, so I think that in the United States, at least I think other parts of the world, uh, the people who have grown up since the Second Vatican Council don't have that attitude unless they pick it up in their families. Uh, but certainly it's not in any textbooks, it's not in any public discourse and so forth. So it's a good question, hard to answer, but I like to think that there's been considerable progress in that regard. I mean, it's, it's well, good, I've said that. One more. Yep. Just for a moment, I would like to turn back to the 16th century. Uh, and it starts with your uh, overview of the Council of Trent as being uh, an agency in many ways for reform. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, as the Council of Trent, uh, uh, individual cities, not necessarily the church officially, but individual cities were creating ghettos for the Italian Jews. The first one in Venice in 1516, uh, Rome, I've, I've actually forgotten, uh, Florence in the 1570s, uh, and so on. Do you know if this question ever came before the Council of Trent? No, it did not. As amazing the number of things that did not come before the Council of Trent. I mean, 
if there's one thing that's characteristic of Roman Catholicism in the 16th century that had immense impact for the future, it was all the activity in the so-called foreign missions. Trent has not a word to say about missions. It simply did not fall within their purview. Uh, Trent did take up the index of prohibited books only because it was thrust upon them. They did not want to do it, but it was thrust upon them. So Trent had a very uh, narrow view of what its remit was. So reform of the church, for the people at the, people at the Council of Trent, it meant simply reform of the three official pastoral offices in the church, the papacy, the bishops, the pastors of parishes. If you look at the reform treatises of the things of Trent, that's all they deal with in one form or another. So again, this is, and you know, when, when, so the ghetto in Rome was established in, let me get this right now, I think about 1555, by uh, 1554 maybe, by Pope Paul IV, and uh, had nothing to do with the council. And it was simply, it was a new problem in Italy with all these uh, Spanish and Portuguese emigres coming in. I mean, what, what are you going to do with them? So it was a new kind of problem in many ways. That was probably, that's true of Venice too, why, why Venice did it. So it's a sad, sad part of the history. Now, if you look at the history of the papacy, for instance, uh, in uh, uh, so the early 19th century, the ghetto was closed, and then uh, Pope Leo XII, uh, about 15 or 1824, reestablished it. Uh, so it goes back and forth, and then finally, just after 1870, of course, it was over. But, okay. So. Well, <coughs> thank you. Um, Thank you, Father O'Malley, and thank you to all of you for joining us for this edifying discussion. Um, but we offer just a warm applause for thank you. <laughs> <laughs>